dawn over Aleppo. Nowhere describes the city's agony more acutely than the Dashifa clinic. <laughs> Mohammed Afash, a boy of 12, has been working here for the past four months. Here he battles to keep a wounded child a girl alive. In this war, Aleppo's children grow old before their time. Aleppo's residents are now expert plane spotters. This is a Syrian Air Force fighter jet hovering above them. They know what that means. A deadly load is about to be dropped. Some people have even stopped reacting to the sounds of war, so familiar now after two years of civil strife. But life goes on. The children and young people of Aleppo still have their playtime. Girls skip, boys play marbles and table football. And sometimes children make playthings out of the spent shells of government rockets. This one, the casing of a Russian cluster bomb. There is little playtime for Mohammed. He's back at work at the clinic. There are no doctor's coats small enough for him. In the and he isn't the only child working here. This is Yusuf Mohammed. He's just 11 years old. He cares tenderly for a fighter from the Free Syrian Army. This is an upside down world in which adults are cared for by children. Before war engulfed and divided Aleppo, the city had some 5,000 medical staff. Now 600,000 civilians are cared for by just 30 doctors and nurses, along with the help of children like Yusuf and Mohammed. They are living scenes of unimaginable horror. <laughs> The river Quaig runs through Aleppo. This side is rebel controlled. Upstream, it's a government area. The river is now the only thing that unites the two sides in this city. The waters are said to be sacred, so sacred that the people never fished here. But these days, they have to. It is no longer sacred. It is sanctified only by the conduct of a crime against humanity. Today, citizens go fishing for corpses. The people come to look for the cargo that is sent downriver to them, the bloated bodies of their sons, husbands and neighbours. 190 men and young boys have been retrieved so far. The ones we saw 
had their hands tied behind their backs, a sign of summary execution. A human chain is formed to lift the bodies from the water. But they keep on coming. This one is of a child no more than 10 years old. Then a naked body is retrieved, the men trying to protect its dignity with a blanket. And another. Four corpses in one morning in Aleppo today. It's now that some peel away in grief and hopelessness. The city's social infrastructure has fractured. Government-run schools have all but closed, so people are educating their own children. This one is run by an Islamic group. They speak English. But prime importance is given to perfecting the reciting of the Quran. Sometimes they lose their way. Religious schools were banned under Assad's rule. In its abandonment, the city in which Christians and Muslims once lived peaceably is changing by the day. For now, this side is controlled by moderates, but it is fast radicalizing. It's been a brutal winter. There's no running water, no electricity. The children queue for water. And many in the city are going hungry. There's little government or international help. Filling this void is Al Nusra, the hardline Islamist group. They are winning hearts and minds because almost alone they are feeding the poor, their aid vans patrol the streets, handing out clothing, food. It is an opportunity too, and it's how fundamentalists and radicals impress the rest of the community with what they're doing. Why, they even organized a public slaughtering of goats. And they make sure that the streets are thoroughly and very publicly cleaned up afterwards. It's going down well with the locals. On this side of the city, what they call the liberated side, the Free Syrian Army is in charge. But it is up high where the battle lines are drawn. The fighters burrow and weave their way through the walls of abandoned apartment blocks, seeking their vantage points. The people who lived here now live in tents far away. Rebels and regime fighters eye each other from sniper holes. Down below, the casualties of their war. It's too dangerous to retrieve them. They're left to rot. Back by the banks of the river Quake, they're preparing to take the retrieved bodies back into town. Little dignity in this. The hearse for these four souls, an open-top truck, carting their bodies through the rain. Night falls, but the city does not rest. Islamist Sheikh Abu Zainab has turned up to give these young fighters a spiritual lecture about how to fight for Allah. But first, our filmmaker Marcel gets introduced to the boys. There is much interest in their German guest. Marcel, Nen, Der Schigel, Nen, who? Almaria. 
القائد ابو حسين يعني يحب التاريخ كثير وكنا صغار يتكلم دائما عن ادول فيتر درس ان شاء الله امار جيب باروتين باروتين The lecture begins. So far, so predictable. They're all ears. Al Nusra are not just giving physical sustenance on the streets, they're also providing spiritual guidance on the front line. But then suddenly, their focus shifts. FIFA? FIFA. FIFA. A laptop is brought out. It's time for a game of FIFA. Bayern Munich versus Barcelona. Suddenly, they are no longer jihadis. 3-0. Just young men playing a football video game. Bayern. Dutch, Dutch. Finish. Finish. 6-0. A makeshift office has been set up to identify victims. Photos have been taken and are organized. Relatives seeking a missing loved one can now look through the pictures on the laptop. These men have just recognized a member of their family. He was one of those found in the river that day. He died because he tried to cross the city's dividing line. An ordinary man looking for ordinary work. Mohamed Afesh is back in the clinic. But this time, 11-year-old Yusuf isn't joining him. Three days after he was filmed here at work, he was hit by a Syrian government shell. You must look away if you can't face what happened next. He is declared dead in the clinic where he comforted others. That film, Agony in Aleppo, was shot by Marcel Metal Zifan.